everyone. Sorry, Ka. <laughs> um, I'm very excited. We're finally here in Southeast Asia. My name is Ayam Yaguchi from the Ethereum Foundation. <laughs> Thank you. So, Ethereum's permissionless value has enabled many people to participate in all different layers, whether you're part of the protocol, R&D, layer twos, applications, or community building and education. While there is so much happening, like Josh just shared a lot of things, I'm often asked what I'm most excited about. I am excited Ethereum is more ready. You saw this on the video too. There are more than 8,000 monthly active contributors, by far the largest in the space um, to, the, to the platform development. More than 100 community hubs across six continents, not yet in Antarctica. <laughs> but um, that now Ethereum is um, consuming a lot less energy after the merge, more than 99% less. Scaling solution, yes, that's very great. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I like this energy. Yeah. Um, scaling solutions have made transactions a lot cheaper and faster, and the cost is actually less than one, uh, less than one cent if you look at the cost for, uh, on the layer twos. Layer twos, uh, you guys are doing an amazing job. <laughs> Advancements with programmable cryptography are enabling privacy in a way that wasn't possible a few years ago, it is easier for wallets to provide better UX. Now, more than ever, building on Ethereum is not only for idealistic reasons. So Ethereum is more ready to build a better humanity. I will give you only one example, decentralized ID. The city of Buenos Aires has finished onboarding 150,000 of its citizens to a quark ID and the ID system built on Ethereum's layer two. By next year, uh, four other cities in Argentina and two cities in Mexico will follow suit. That's, this is a, <laughs> yes. I should mention that layer two is ZK Sync, congratulations. And also, the country of Bhutan's DID system is migrating to Ethereum's mainnet, currently successfully deployed on testnet. And up until the last few years, Ethereum was not the obvious choice for these places to choose. Now the infrastructure is ready, but why do you choose Ethereum among many other things? There are many ways to answer this. But if I have to put it in very simply, Ethereum is built for the long term. All the values we care, credible neutrality, open source, open participation, decentralization, could interfere with quick progress, quick growth, quick progress that we could blog about in the short term. That does not mean you cannot execute with these values. We saw the phenomenal execution of the merge in 2020. Um, 2022. But the execution is much, much harder, and that's the trade off Ethereum chooses to make always. All to be built for the long term by the people of the ecosystem that we all hope to also last for the long term. If we keep making the right decisions by really committing to those values, these values become the deep and strong roots that enable the long lasting resilient ecosystem. And when I say long lasting, we are looking at the time when you and I do not exist. Even with all the longevity supplements and methods that you are trying. <laughs> and while Ethereum is built for the long term, there is a world I want to see beyond that. Infinite Garden is the vision that I've been introducing through the Ethereum Foundation to the broader community. Infinite symbolize the concept of infinite games we want to foster across the entire ecosystem, whether you're part of nonprofit, for profit, public or private sectors. We are part of a collective ongoing game. The goal isn't for one player to dominate the 
and end the game. That would make the game finite, but rather to keep the game going. Why I choose the word garden? There are several reasons, and today I'd like to explain by sharing this fascinating wisdom that I learned from the region of Southeast Asia. First, I will start with a quiz. Imagine I give you a piece of paper that has this drawing of an island. This may not look like an island. I actually drew it with a pencil. <laughs> uh, I say there are four kingdoms on this island, kingdom A, B, C, D. And I ask you, I give you a pencil and ask you to draw the four areas of kingdom, kingdom A, B, C, D. How would you do it? Did you imagine something like this? Or this? But you probably did not think of this. Mandala. You might have seen this type of visual before. Mandala in Sanskrit means a circle. It's a ritual and spiritual symbol inspired by Eastern religion, like Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Shinto. Now, mandalas like this are often used for healing practices or meditation. But in Southeast Asia, mandala has an additional meaning. It refers to a system of governance that was common from ancient times through the early modern time. Mandala refers to the circles of power that coexisted without clear boundaries. Power was strong at the center and ambiguous and blurry at the edges. Some mandalas overlapped, while other areas remained beyond the reach of any circle. For example, the kingdom of Ayutthaya in the current Thailand and Lan Shan in the current Laos, for example, shared overlapping spheres of power and influence. People in this overlapping space sometimes had duties to both kingdoms, but they were not necessarily oppressed by competing influences. Instead, they benefited from their dual affiliation, gaining access to opportunities, rich cultural exchanges, and religious freedom. The mandala, this mandala structure endured over 1,500 years. The concept of mandala inspires us in different ways. First, visually, circles and spheres inspire us to think beyond rigid boundaries. While many of us might have tendency to think in squares or with clear boundaries, open and overlapping spaces with circles and spheres reflect more fluid and interconnected uh, interactions. Today, all former mandala kingdoms are governed by states with clear boundaries. But things on the internet, for example, still operate in spheres of influence, like mandalas. And I like to share uh, two specific like wisdom from mandala that contributed to their long longevity. Syncreticism. This is the word, it seems like e even English native speakers <laughs> don't really know. Uh, it's a, did you know? <laughs> well, it, I, I clearly did not know, but, um, but I heard this is also not really common. It's a concept of acceptance, merging, and blending of religions, cultures, and practices which was woven into the mandala system of governance and cultural influence. No single culture of, or religion was imposed across the entire area. Instead, there was an acceptance of various beliefs, creating a fusion of Hinduism, Buddhism, indigenous practices, and later Islam. And another wisdom, despite their distinct political structures and diverse ethnic groups, the mandala kingdoms shared core values and cultural practices. These shared values are often deeply rooted in religion, governance, trade, and diplomacy, which help foster a common identity across these otherwise independent kingdoms. And monasteries and trade routes 
acted as a decentralized hub for shared learning and values that united different religion, uh, sorry, different regions without central control. So, how do we adapt this wisdom to our ecosystem? I want to share the story of the Ethereum Foundation described as an, as a, uh, an example. If we think of EF as one circle, it does not act as a singular center force that observe um, or control all other circles within the ecosystem. It law is, its law is not to make itself the center, but to nurture initiatives and teams that embody the same principle, allowing the values of Ethereum to spread across a distributed network. In this way, it acts more like a monastery, fostering growth and collaboration rather than a castle with a single king. I will share the story of EF journey. This is how the EF originally was. The Ethereum ecosystem was equivalent to the Ethereum Foundation when it started. And I'm adding this orange color to uh, show the highlight the space that shares values. So please remember, orange is values. This is when the ecosystem began to grow, with circles of talents and teams outside of the ES also contributing to Ethereum. I joined Ethereum and the EF also around this time. This is what people might think is a typical way for an organization to grow the Ethereum Foundation observing all the circles in, hiring all the talents inside the organization to grow. The EF kingdom is, is, is observing all the energy outside, becoming a bigger circle. In this scenario, the orange area of shared value still stays confined within the Ethereum Foundation. Or another misconception we often hear since we have a guiding principle of subtraction at the EF, people often think by executing on the philosophy of subtract subtraction, the EF is shrinking and the knowledge of shared values is also becoming smaller. But this is the wrong way to view it. In fact, what is actually happening is something like this. The EF is nurturing an expanding ecosystem so the orange area of shared values grows beyond EF, direct, beyond EF direct control. The philosophy of subtraction does help create more space for collaboration and innovation, allowing these values to spread naturally across the entire ecosystem rather than being limited by one single entity. One concrete example of our action is this. The EF has been working on creating other institutions with both EF members or people outside. We've supported the launch of organizations such as Xerox Park, the Nomic Foundation, Autobeat, and more recently, Argot Collective and GeodeWork, which are working to be independent. Zooming in on this dynamic, Xerox Xerox Park, for, for instance, is committed to advancing programmable cryptography, expanding Ethereum's boundaries with its sphere of influence. In this way, ideas in this, our space also have spheres of influence, and we do not want to limit the potential by EF owning them all. So whether an organization is inside EF or outside matters less in this context. What truly matters is that ideas from these institutions are pushing the boundaries, sharing values broader to the broader space. And what's great is that in Ethereum, the EF is not the only organization, um, not the only entity expanding its community and ideas while sharing these core values. Other teams and organizations are contributing to this effort each adding their unique perspective and energy to the collective ecosystem. I see the potential of Ethereum and all the things beyond it as exponentially vast due to the countless future circles that can be created whether or not the EF is directly involved. 
This is the resilience of Ethereum. With many organizations and their ideas growing their spheres of influence and some blending and merging, the ecosystem remains diverse and colorful, yet they're all interconnected by shared roots, the foundational values of Ethereum. It represents the true innovation of the ecosystem, connecting ideas and effort, uh, efforts in a way that has never been done. This is why I call it a garden. Gardens are continuously growing, evolving, and changing. Underneath the surface, underneath the soil, there are roots, microbes, fungi, interconnected, coexisting without clear boundaries, sharing information. And nurturing diversity is critical because biodiversity is in the only way for all of them to survive. They're all playing a long, infinite game together. Now, going back to this idea, thinking beyond the time of our existence, which one of these scenarios do you think will last longer? One big circle observing all other circles or nurturing other circles and sharing values? I hope the answer is clear now. Um, imagine an ecosystem where every circle has the freedom to grow, expand, and innovate, sharing the same powerful values. That's how we built something truly remarkable, long-lasting. And that is the end of my talk. I hope you can discover these values throughout this DevCon week and also notice the circles around you. Thank you very much.